Yeah, we okay. can see you. Oh, I'm so happy to be part of this session and to connect with the uh, friends of Eric around the world and with the Grimm family. And I also want to thank Buzz and Suzette and Jack for hosting this event and bringing us all together. I'm going to share my screen. OK. Um, I'm gonna talk, make some personal remarks more than uh, Eric's scientific contributions because I think we'll get to those later. One of the few pleasures of this COVID year has been to have the chance to have think intensively about Eric and his friendship and the ways that he influenced us. Eric over the decades has been a, a bit of a big brother for me. He's been a friend, a trusted counselor, a compatriot, Okay, As we just, yeah. Are, are you, uh, we only see the black screen. I just want to double check. Yeah, that's right. Okay, that's good. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. He, so he's been a friend, a trusted counselor, and a compatriot as we struggled through our careers. I want to share a few memories that I have of Eric in the early years as we were just getting started. Our friendship began in 1978 at the AMQA meeting in Edmonton, Alberta. I don't know how many of you remember that meeting, but the topic that year was the ice-free corridor. And there were some very contentious debates and lively discussions. And I was a new graduate student at the University of Washington, and this was my first scientific conference. So it's no, it's no understatement to say that I was a deer in the headlights. I was extremely shy and uncomfortable to be part of this large gathering. But Perhaps at the icebreaker, I ran into a group of students from the University of Minnesota, seemingly led by this guy named Eric Grimm. And they took me under their wing. Eric explained how the meeting worked with plenaries and poster sessions and where the intellectual action lay. And surprisingly, Eric also seemed to know a lot about Edmonton, where to get the best hamburger, with the most French fries, where the cheapest beer was. And, and I have to say, I followed Eric and the other LRC students almost like a dog because they knew where things were happening. And I appreciated um, their help. And also it's one of the reasons why we all love AMCO meetings. Our friendship was cemented in 1980 when I met up with Eric in Cambridge at the International Palynology Conference. And there he introduced me to his new bride, the lovely Jane Allard. Together, we hung out at the meeting and were richly entertained by the cynical observations of Bill Watts. Following the conference, we went on a field excursion led by Bill through Western Ireland in the company of Henry Lamb, uh, Jock McAndrews, Rule Janssen, Ray Spear, Les Swinner. For me, the conference and the landscapes and the nights drinking Guinness with new friends uh, was intoxicating and it, it brought me to a fork in the road. I decided after that meeting that I would continue for a PhD and it would be in quaternary paleoecology. Bill Watts was a visiting scientist at the Quaternary Research Center and he and Estella Leopold received an NSF grant in 1980 to Core Lakes in the Northwest. And Bill invited Eric to join us. Let's see, whoops. Bill invited Eric to join us and Les Swinner and Tom Davis uh, on these coring expeditions and to help with some of the analyses. Bill, Les and Eric lived in a very smart house on Lake Washington and that was the hub of social activity for a while. Bill always said that Eric was technically the best when it came to field work and we relied on his skills mightily. Eric designed the platform, organized the gear, helped me core the sites that we'd be in my dissertation. We cored in the rain, in the bogs, and on many, many lakes. Peter Dunwoody was there and Herb, whom I had met at Cambridge, came out to join the fun. After that fall, Bill told me that I needed to go to Minneapolis and take Ed Cushing's course on pal palynology. I guess this was considered the gold standard in palynology training. So, so in the winter of 1981, I headed to, headed to Minneapolis 
for a semester at the LRC. Eric was very much in his prime in Cushing's lab, just finishing his PhD on sites in the big woods and, and feeling pretty good about life. He helped me find housing and he invited me to watch Viking games on TV with John and Jim Allmendinger and Jane. It was the best. More than his hospitality, Eric was always looking over my shoulder and helping me with pollen identifications, critiquing my interpretations, and uh, in Eric fashion, explaining ways to do things better. Like a big brother, this advice was usually spot on, but not always appreciated. <laughs> I went to the LRC several times after that semester to work on Elk Lake and other projects, and each time it was great to hang out with Eric and Jane. And in the course of those visits, Herb, Eric, and I hatched a proposal idea to study the biogeography of the Northern Great Plains uh, from the Dakotas to Eastern Montana. Now, Eric was interested in Cottonwood Lake and Bear Butte Lake in South Dakota. And I was looking for old records along the Rocky Mountain front in Montana. The proposal was submitted by Herb he requested two postdocs, and when the award was made in 1984, I had gotten a position in Pittsburgh, and Eric was a research associate at the LRC. Coring those lakes in the Great Plains with Herb and Eric was really, really tough in a number of ways. We'd leave Minneapolis in the late afternoon and drive through the night to reach the sites at dawn. And with Herb being present, We'd, we'd start coring right away after a quick bite of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. My memory is of chain hoists, windy, extremely hot, bitterly cold days, rattlesnakes, and enormous, enormous thunderstorms. In Sturgis, South Dakota, we arrived at Bear Butte Lake at the same time as the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally. Motorcycles roared through the campground day and night, and our coring efforts on the lake offered great entertainment to the boozed up bikers. As most of you know, the Great Plains and Black Hills had Eric by the heartstrings, and the history of these regions was central to his research career. He went on to core Kettle Lake, Moon Lake, and this is a picture of Brush Lake with some of the folks that are on the call today. And in typical Eric fashion, the diagrams, the pollen diagrams that he produced were always done in exquisite detail and offered tantalizing insights. Eric with his penchant for thoroughness always found something interesting that the rest of us overlooked. The expression of a, a climate event at 9,300 years ago in the Great Plains, the relationship between ragweed and fire, the possible causes of radiocarbon dating problems in Cretaceous sediments, and, and, and the significance of struvite in lakes. Now, struvite is a phosphate mineral that builds kidney stones in people, but Eric figured they were pro it was probably left by migratory birds. My encounters with Eric continued over the years and I could describe them all in detail. I had a memorable weekend in Florida with Bill Watts and Eric in the 1990s, looking at sites, including Lake Tulane and Lake Andy, Annie, which he later cored. And we had a fine time in 2007 in the Black Hills with Eric, Jane, Sherry Fritz, Joe Holmquist, Joe and Ann Donovan, Alan and Hazel Ashworth, Vera, Markraff, and Russ Graham. We hiked to the top of Harney Peak to watch the 4th of July fireworks on Mount Rushmore. And then later on that trip, Eric took us to Wind Caves National Park and we visited Mammoth Hot Springs. And as Buzz mentioned, at the Inqua Congress just a couple of years ago, we had this wonderful meal with Eric at our VRBO in Dublin. Uh, and the evening went into the wee hours with lots of laughs and, and lots, of, lots of stories and conversations. Recently, Eric came to MSU to help me teach a methods course for a few weeks. And as usual, I learned new things on a variety of topics during his visit, not all of them related to paleoecology. 
We talked about the realism of the TV series Deadwood, which was Eric knew every detail of. He talked about the best way to make salsa, the bio biogeography of magpies, and of course his endless efforts to improve the scaffolding of tilia and expand the use of neotoma. Eric's knowledge flow is endless. And I, I honestly, I wish I could say that I remembered all that Eric has told me over the years. For me, Eric's loss, his death is a loss on so many levels and I, I don't know how the holes will be filled. I could turn to Eric to answer any question in paleoecology. He was also a sounding board for my professional concerns and he was rich in research ideas. In the back of my mind, I can hear Eric telling me that I should be using ancient DNA to see if there's a glacial refugia of white spruce in Yellowstone. What a great idea. I always imagined Eric in retirement in the Black Hills, playing the role of gentleman science, behind the scenes advocate and local field trip guide. No doubt there would have been endless topics to discuss in the home that he and Jane were building and lots of good times outdoors. Sadly, we won't have those experiences. So in closing, I just wanna send my love to Jane and Maria and the Grimm family. As we celebrate this extraordinary person and mourn his loss, rest in peace, dear friend. We know that your spirit soars somewhere over the Black Hills and you're telling us to go forward, do good work and enjoy the moment. <laughs>